Hello, I'm Chuck and I'm going to talk to you today about using Artware to program the FSC 3000 site controller. Artware uh, gives you the ability to replace command line programming. Uh, it also gives you the ability to store configurations for multiple site controllers. So we're going to do a basic overview of how the system's set up and then we're going to go through some functions with it and then we'll show you the usability of it. As you can see there's tabs down on the bottom. There's also files and settings on the top. The top settings are for information, for example, your database, where your database gets saved, if you want to bring databases up or save them for multiple store uses, you save them into databases and give them names. View gives you site information, terminal pump control, networks, the same as your site tabs do down here. Global settings, products, units, it basically decides what you're, you're telling the system as you're using. Gallons, liters, quarts, these can be anything depending on how you're setting up and what kind of a system you're setting up. You also have types. This is your fuel type table. This tells you uh, grade one is unleaded, product two is plus, three, so on and so forth. This also gives you the ability to change this to whatever you need. So if product one is different than unleaded, you can change it here. This is where you change what your measurements are, gallons, liters, or quarts, whatever you have set up. Also gives you the ability to set the pricing. Now, if you're connected to the site, you can do your pricing in here and send your pricing down to your site controller and out to your card readers or your dispensers. If you've got a price sign, you can set it your price sign grades here and it will fully function and send your prices out to the price sign at the same time. Your network setup gives you the different parameters and, and fuel product codes for each one of the different networks. For example, you're on unleaded. Uh, the fuel man gas card says that's product 002. Payment tech calls that 001. You can see as you change the, the product types here, it changes what they are in each one of the networks. As you go to restrictions, this is your product restrictions, the same as what you would set up in your artware. One of the func or in your Phoenix, one of the functions to remember is that what you change in artware, you also need to change in your Phoenix. Your quantity restrictions of what you can apply to a code that's in the card. So zero zero is unlimited. These can be changed. Zero one's twenty gallons. You can restrict by volume or by currency. Reasonability, if you're using odometer reasonability, you would go into this. Defining the card record. This is one of the first things you do. Uh, if you're going to use account numbers, uh, expiration dates, monthly allocations, daily allocations, PIN numbers. Well, if you check PIN numbers, you've got the ability to invalidate the PIN after three bad PIN entries. You can save odometer entries. You can use odometer reasonability if your system's allowing it product restrictions, quantity restrictions, all of this. This is like what you would do in command line, only it's a lot simpler to do it and it applies to the entire card deck as you're going through. You also have an additional feature to process Voyager cards as proprietary cards. We use this in some instances where a customers, uh, a municipality has Voyager cards that they're using for driving out in the other parts of states or cities, uh, but when they're in their own fuel yards, they wanted to use it as a proprietary card, so we can do that. After you make any changes, you always want to hit apply, otherwise the changes won't take hold. Tiered pricing. Uh, tiered pricing is a function of, uh, of uh, the ability to set products and pricing depending on a number on the cards. Tiered pricing is also used if you're doing tiered accounts, which allows Visa, MasterCard, and proprietary cards to get a discount depending on a code. 
defining your transaction record. This tells you what's on your transactions and how they're going to be stored in the system. Wraparound means that uh, if the system set at 500 transactions, when it gets to the 500th transaction, it'll drop it off and add a new one. So it always takes the old one, drops it, and puts a new one in. Write over means that if you have a problem transaction, it will right over that transaction. Otherwise the system will stop depending on what your transaction table is. Standard is 500 transactions. Once you reach 500 transactions, if you don't have write over writ checked, when a transaction is a bad transaction, the system will stop at the 500 transactions. You'll have to manually go in and erase that transaction to be used to, for the system to run properly. Save unauthorized users. That is a, a way for any card that's entered into the card reader will be stored. Um, if you've got somebody, for example, that comes in and they uh, use their Visa card instead of their proprietary card, it'll actually scan the card and say, hey, there was a, a card in the system that's not a network card, here's the card number. Um, if somebody uses a, a Pacific Pride card at a CFN site, it'll show that number in the system. Um, displays, these are what you want to show up on the screens as the person's entering their cards. Account, driver, vehicle, date and time, host capture time, any of the information that you may want in the tra in, on the screens for the transactions. Um, send prompts in computer format or f computer format check data in header. This is stuff that's going out to the networks and how it's configured. Your receipt body, this is what's showing up on the receipts. Your card number, your transaction number, products, all of that information. Um, this is typically just for proprietary cards. Receipt configuration for network cards is decided at the networks. Your connection button is allowing you to connect to the system. Your help button does two functions, tells you about what version of artware you're on, and what build you're on. Also gives you a help button and depending on what version of, of software you're using in the computers, if you're on uh, Vista or uh, XP, the help button will give you help files on it. If you're on Windows 7 or Windows 8, this function won't work. Site tabs. So we start with a site, a site ID, whatever your site ID wants to be, you're going to change it to something. Uh -oh. So uh, site name, whatever your site's going to be named address, the address of the site, city, state, all of the information that you want to put in, phone number. This is information that's just on the site tab. This does not actually go down into the site controller. The FSC information, um, when you read your site, you're going to fill out the serial number and the firmware. When you first open Artware, this is going to be blank. Um, Fleet Link, dual language, if you're on a site that uh, you're going to do multiple languages, you need to check the dual language button. Fleet Link is a function we don't currently use. Um, display type, whether you're using graphics or 2x16. Graphics would be the COPT or the FIT500. 2x16 would be the K800 hybrid. Connection communication options, whether you're a direct connection, you fill out your information and your COM port, your baud rate. This is standard, the 7 even 1 for communicating to the FSC 3000. Modem, you would have the same parameters and then the phone number of wherever you're connecting. TCP IP is when you're connecting your laptop directly through the Ethernet port of the site controller. You can do this function when you're initially programming the system. You can program through TCP IP. Uh, once you've programmed and, and updated your artware or your um, administrative passwords and done a start, you will no longer be able to 
to uh, program through TCP IP. At that point you would have to program through a direct connection. Bluetooth, if you've got Bluetooth set up on the system you can pair and program through Bluetooth. Wi-Fi modem the same way, you can set up a Wi-Fi and then be able to get into the system through Wi-Fi. As you do everything you want to make sure that you save it and, and that way it'll keep it as a function. Uh, the printer USB, so the system, the FSC site controller comes with a USB stick that will record all your transactions. You can also add a journal printer to it and record your transactions on a journal printer. This is a newer function in the last couple of years. In previous versions of the site controller you had to choose whether you were going to do a journal printer or the USB key. Now you can actually run both. When you set a journal printer and if you have a journal printer on you can actually have the system disable authorization on error. You can stop line skip between transactions. You can print log on the first of the month. You can also prompt for responses. You can have account numbers and card numbers on the on the printout or you can have account driver vehicle and odometer on the printouts. With the USB key you're going to enable USB memory and you're, you make a choice of whether you want to authorize if USB key is not inserted or not. If you check that, if you remove the USB key the system will not operate. And your Phoenix site ID needs to match what's in your Phoenix. And remember, as you're going through and programming, always click Apply to save your what you've done. Tanks, if you're going to use any function of, of what tanks are assigned to which dispensers and pumps, this is where you fill out what you've got in each one of those tanks. If you were connected to the site controller, you would see this Read button lit up and it would say send as you were programming information in. So the system can be designed to either go into Artware, program the entire site up and then connect to the site controller and send or you can be connected to the site controller and send as you're completing each tab. Oops. Oh yes, sorry. You have to save when you go to move between tabs. Pump controls, this is where you decide what kind of pump control you've got on the site. So you're, whether you're doing DPC, which is direct pump control, PCM, which is a pump control module. Pump control modules are for mechanical pumps. DPC is for electronic dispensers. You also have a third choice, which isn't here because it's not in the system of UPC. UPC is universal pump control, which allows you to share your dispensers with a POS system. So as you set up a pump controller, you've got to remember which pump controller you're on as you move to the next tab. So whatever pump control you're on, that next tab will decide what you can have for dispensers and stuff. So if you're used to programming in uh, command line, this is your PCT. So this is PCT1 and then your positions are your pumps. So pump controller, whatever type of pump controller you're on, make sure you highlight which one you're on when you move to the pump tabs because different things will show up in the pump tab according to which pump controller you're on. This is where the most mistakes are made when people click on one and they go to pumps and they go, hey, wait a minute, these aren't my pumps. It's because you've not on the right one in your pump controls. So as your pumps, you're entering your position, your pump number, your pole ID number, and this is for DPC where you have your pole ID. If you're on a PCM, as you get pumps, you won't have any pole ID number. Um, pump is installed, use of pump sentry. Pump sentry is a, a function that basically turns the pump off if it sees three zero quantity transactions. This is a safety feature so that if a pulser goes down, you don't have somebody getting free fuel. So after it sees three zero quantity transactions, this pump will actually be turned off. And what will happen is you'll see in here, it will say installed, but it won't be running. Your max quantity, this is something to discuss with your customer, the maximum quantity that's going to go through each one of the individual pumps your pulses per unit, whether it's a 1 to 1, a 10 to 1, a 100 to 1, or a 1000 to 1, and then your timeouts. 
your handle timeout, 60 seconds, your miscellaneous pumps. So this is all of the different things. So basically the way the system works is somebody puts in their card, they go out to the pump, we're waiting to see that handle. We've authorized that pump, now we're looking to see that handle. So how long does it take to walk from the card reader to the handle and be able to pick that handle up? That's a time you decide. Missing pulse, that's how many seconds you want between the time the system seen a pulse and the time the system says I better shut down because I'm not seeing anything else. Um, and your first pulse. So once the handle's picked up, the system's waiting to see that first pulse. So even though the handle's picked up, they may not have that nozzle in their vehicle yet. So as they put the nozzle in the vehicle and then they start to squeeze the handle, that's when you see the first pulse. Calculate how long it's going to take for that to happen and give some extra leeway and then put that in seconds. Fueling minutes. This is a function of how long do you want the fuel to be able to run out of that nozzle. So this depends on typically what kind of vehicles are being fueled and what kind of a site you're at. If you're at a, a normal site with uh, gas station style pumps that are pumping 30, 40 gallons at a time or less, then you probably want this set at 10 or 15 minutes. If you're at a site that has a bulk facility where they may be pumping 4,000 gallons into something, then you may want to leave it at 30 minutes. The thing to remember is that if that nozzle were dropped on the ground and didn't shut off, this system would run for 30 minutes before it would say, okay, I've ran 30 minutes and now I'm shutting it down. So take that into consideration as you're doing it. On a PCM, you can only have one pump or one hose in at a time. So PCM, remember, is controlling a mechanical dispenser, each handle of a mechanical dispenser. If we go back and we do a DPC, you'll notice you've got a multi-hose dispenser, so MPDs, um, multi-product dispensers. So then you're programming each hose for the grade and, and what that is. You're also programming what tank it's coming out. You can also program in the, to the mechanical totalizers that are on the dispensers. And then you can actually do a, a function of seeing what the totalizers are each month. Same thing, um, your poll ID, what sequence it is, um, whether it's standard, without or high line, depending on what type of, of DPC you've got programmed. Max quantity is the same as in the PCM, and your timeouts are set the same. And then, like I said, every function you have to go in and check it and make sure you've got it set up the same, or, or what you've got on that side and those dispensers and stuff. So once you've got those set up, then you can go to terminals. Now the terminal is what you're doing for uh, card readers. So DTC is, is uh, dispenser terminal control, which is a card reader in the dispenser. COPT, the FIT500, the hybrid are the, sep the standalone card terminals. So as you can see, this site has three D terminals set up. DTC, and basically terminal ID, what type of terminal it is, decline timeout, prompt timeout. If you're finding you're having issues with cards going out to networks and having timeouts or having uh, declines happening, you may need to change your decline and your prompt timeouts. The way this works is basically the system is saying, hey, if I don't get something in 25 seconds, I'm going to time out and say it's declined. So if you're asking for a bunch of information like odometer, miscellaneous information, if it's going to take that person longer than 25 seconds to enter that information, you may want to change this. The same with the prompt timeout. You can adjust it how long it is between each prompt or how long each prompt is going to stay there. Uh, reader error, display type, receipt counter, these are all functions that are going to happen after you've been up and running for a while. There will be information in there if you read the site. Operation status, installed. Keyboard access, this gives you the ability to enter uh, functions on the keyboards by hand. If you're going to enter PIN numbers, you're going to need to do this. You can also set this to hand enter cards and if on a proprietary site somebody doesn't want to have cards but they want to do keypad entry, you would check that box. 
Uh, the thing to remember, if you're doing uh, pin numbers and you're, you're allowing keyboard access, if you're worried about somebody hand entering a card in, you want to make your keyboard access longer than the pin number but shorter than a card number. For example, if they're using a five digit employee number as their um, pin number, you would put six digits in there to allow for an extra digit. But their cards would have to be longer than six digit to be entered into the system. That way they could punch in an employee ID but not be able to hand punch in a card number and get the pump to start. Issuing receipts is only done if you've got a receipt printer. You can see that this one's got a receipt printer because it's highlighted. If you had a COPT or a FIT500 uh, that didn't have a receipt printer, this would be all grayed out. If you had a hybrid, you wouldn't see a receipt printer on there. Um, limit access to pumps. Our system works on the parameter that every card reader could activate every pump on a site. So even with DTC, which is dispenser card readers, you could still turn those in to be able to access any pump on the site. Limiting access to pumps allows you to set that card reader to only activate certain pumps. So for example, you've got a DTC here. If you say you want that DTC to only operate that pump, you've got, oops, you've got to remember to save them. So you go in and, and take a look at which pumps that DTC's got on it. It's got four pumps on it and they're labeled 8, pump 8, pump 92, pump 10, and pump 9. You would go into the terminal control and you would put those in here. 8, 92, 10, and 9 and you would save that. And that would, that would only allow that DTC to turn those dispensers on. If for some reason your COPT died and your other DTT died, you could uncheck that button and it would allow that one DTC to run all the pumps that are on the site. You also have prompts. These are your prompts. You can change the wording on these prompts. Um, just be careful on what you're what you're doing and and you're limited to the length of the of the reader that's out there so if you've got a 2 by 16 display you're limited to 16 characters and spaces count as characters so you've got to remember to count each letter each space and any other characters that you have in there you also have default ones so you've got a default cat which is a card reader at terminal you got cat tiered account, which is if you're doing tiered accounts, a default 2x16, a Pacific Pride 2x16, Irving, which is Canadian, and a Gas Boy ICR. You also have messages. These are just normal messages that would come up on the screen depending on what's going on. So reading card, remove card, incorrect reading, these are all the same functions. You can default them with a default 2 by 16 the same as you've done before. Wayne Cat, Gas Boy ICR. Um, if your DPC and your DTC is set for Gilbarco, this Wayne Cat and, and Wayne Cat signal would change to Gilbarco whenever the Gilbarco functions are. Your header is what's on the top of the receipts. Trailer, whatever you're putting on the bottom of the receipts. If you start noticing that you're having problems with receipt paper not coming out far enough or being nobody being able to grab it, you change the line structure. So if you put it on line one, thanks for shopping, that's all it's going to print is one. If you move thanks for shopping down to four, it would actually print three other lines, thus extending the paper out of the chute a little bit. Got to remember to save as you go, and I, even though I'm not, I'm just changing stuff back and forth. It's still going to require me to save it. Networks. So depending on what's in your site controller, you may have networks that you're going to activate. 
this is where you set up the information for those networks. As you can see, you can add a network. You get a drop-down menu for whatever network they have. Now, you can add any network to this, but if the flag in the system's not set to accept that network, it won't work. So even though you set up a network and you set all the parameters in for that network, if the flag's not available in the system, then you're not going to be able to do anything with it. Um, host configuration, that's going to give you the ability to send it out and have the host configure what that network's going to do. Uh, this becomes really important with bypass network because in bypass you purchase parts of networks. So Visa MasterCard comes standard, but if you want Visa Fleet, you're going to have to have that configured by the host. If you're going to do MasterCard Fleet, that has to be configured by the host and other programs and other parts for it. It's the same with uh, with CFN and the new uh, COM data card. You have to configure that in the system to be able to do it. ISO tables, usually you can get some information depending on the network on what ISO tables are available. When you run into a runtime error, this is going to shut the system down because that part of uh, the network or the part of the program is not available. So this actually turns your artware off and then you've got to restart it. 